Okay, so um, so the first thing I would, so I'll start with a brief introduction and then I will hand over to my co-panelist, right? So in my management class, they taught us that there are three ways to measure, measure results, right? So effectiveness, efficiency, and I think the last one is economical. I was trying to remember it, but MTN did not allow me to search it, so sorry if I'm wrong. Let's blame MTN CEO. But yes, the, MT, the meaning of effectiveness is being successful in producing a desired or intended result. And the series that we've been through so far is on habits of, seven habits of highly effective people. So I was thinking, so what is the result that we are supposed to create, right? Well, how can we measure our efficiency, right? How can we say that we've produced a desired or intended result? And I think that as Christians, and even the way that pastor has taken us through that series, right? We are, we are, we've learned habits that can help us to be and to do all that God wants for us, which should be our ultimate desire and intended result. So in a way, we can say we've learned seven habits on how to be and to do all that God has desired for us. So whether you are married or single or a student, right, the message is for everybody. So in terms of communication, you don't only communicate with your husband, you communicate with your boss at work, you communicate with your children, you communicate with your domestic staff, with your neighbors, and so on. Right, so I would want us to share some of the insights before our panelists take over. Who would like to share one or two insights that you've gotten from? Okay, so you would need to go to the back, sorry, um, if you would like to share. Just very briefly, in one minute or less, what are some of the key things or one thing that was said that really stood out to you or that has perhaps shaped your life, the way you approach life. Because I know during the women's meeting last week, a lot of people mentioned that, oh, this is what pastor has been trying to teach us all, all this while, right? So I would really want to know, please don't air me. Um, yes, maybe, what? okay, 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 we have a few people. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, please go on. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think for me, the, one of the very first parts, understanding your circle of influence and your circle of concern and being able to differentiate the two. I think that it's easy sometimes to, you know, <clears throat> one of the things, Pastor, um, it's easy to get so carried away with your circle of concern worrying about it, but it's not really something you can change. Yes, you want that to be okay, but eventually it's not your responsibility as it were. So that, that's definitely something that stuck with me and I'm still thinking over. Thank you. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Good morning, church. Um, so this series, um, there were um, lots of life transforming, um, you know, tips for me. First of all, I want to thank God for um, Pastor Tokwe, and <laughs> this series just made me look and say, I, I love this man of God because he actually gave us a lot of tips. So when he started, um, there was, <laughs> yeah, he deserves it. So when he started, um, I was very slow in catching up when he started. And, you know, he said something about paradigm shifts. But it just kept coming to me and until I had um, a class with Mrs. Deborah Ikongbe. And she said something. So I committed an atrocity. And <laughs> that's because, like, if you bring your nonsense to me, I'm going to change it for you. So it came to Mrs. Deborah, and Mrs. Deborah said, she told um, Aisha, she told her, uh, okay, just let it go with Kayade. It's probably a problem with his belief system. And the belief system stood out for me, and she said it was in line with what Pastor Tokwe was saying, the paradigm shifts. She talked more and more and everything. And I had to sit down and reflect. And like, yes, the belief system was not... Um, 
the belief system is that part of, okay, I want to change it for you. If you bring nonsense my way, you know, <laughs> I'll just change it for you. And I started to reflect. I started to reflect. And it had actually helped me. Then another thing that stood out for me is um, Pastor Tokwa was able to put things in, um, so process in a way like he took it layers by layers, took it layers by layers. And then Charles, when Charles had his speech, it stood out for me also because when the summary of what Charles said was, um, you know, are you prepared for, sorry, you, you are not, are you prepared for the work God is going to do? You are thinking this way. But God is coming to do a work you are not expecting. So it made me feel like you probably are going to miss out on it if you are not open to what God has you to do. And it kind of changed my prayer points to pray that regardless of my will, God's will. You know, I used to pray that before, but it helped me intensify that prayer. Then um, also, when Pastor Tokwe talked about win-win... So that's why I have questions, the win-win. <laughs> because it got to a point, Pastor Tokwe said something that, um, you know when you are doing things for peace to reign, that's a win-lose. So I can't remember very clearly, but it wasn't a win-win. So in my mind, I'm like, because sometimes I can be this person, like, for my loved ones, I just want peace to reign. Do your thing, and I just move on. You know, and Pastor Tokwe said, that is not a win-win. You know, and... Somehow, I'm still very unclear on how to, like, work that part out. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I think we have one last insight to share. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, um, what I have to share is that from what I actually understood so far, um, one thing that stood out for me was the empathetic listening. Because um, I'm this kind of person, I don't know if, you, if you're really familiar with temperament, the four type of temperament. You could, um, categorically, I could categorically say I'm a choleric kind of person. So, you know, it's, it's uh, you being able, it's something, that empathetic listening is something I am gradually trying to, you know, um, imbibe in myself because I'm this kind of person that before you talk, I really have like, okay, four or five reasons why you are doing something or you're saying something. So, so I'm actually trying to, I'm, try, I'm actually now trying to ensure that, okay, I'm not just listening to just listen, but I'm listening to understand from the other person's perspective. And uh, it also gave me a revelation when um, Pastor Tope talked about the win-win that win-win stood out for me because I was like, okay, so when you, if you're able to listen empathetically, you're also, it's, it's a win-win in the sense that you're understanding from this person's perspective and every assumptions you have or you've, you've had as a, as a result of, you know, non-explanation is being resolved. And then there is like a mutual understanding and it's something I'm, I am really, 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 really grateful that I actually enjoyed Thank this Thank you so series. much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So before the panelists share their insights, in case there are people here who perhaps... Okay. There, this, Mr. Morris, did you want to share? Yes. Okay. Just, please um, go ahead just very a, briefly. Just a brief um, my, okay. uh, things I... I I wrote down that has been able to characterize the whole sessions for me, the whole episode and them um, for me. Um, first and there's something I, I understand. I have, we all know the meaning, but I think um, the understanding Pastor Pested, uh, pointed really defined um, it um, in its essence. Something we call responsible. We talk about res responsibility, we use the word, but the meaning Pastor gave it um, was responsible. So, and I've come to understand that um, your, your, your actions, you're responsible for your actions. Yeah. So when things happen, the response you give matters a lot. Yeah. So it's not just being responsible, but responsible. So I wrote that responsible is the ability to respond to things. That ability to respond to things is called responsible. And that has actually um, guided me through some of the actions during the course of this, um, uh, this series. Then, non-responsible, the inability to do so. So uh, that has quite, the, the meaning uh, during the time of this um, series really, really is very profound for me. Then something again I also noted um, is um, 
two things affect us. The circle of consign and circle of influence. So in everything we do, we must understand that two things, these are two uh, prominent things in our, in our every endeavor. Circle of consign and circle of influence. We have control of the circle of consign, but we do not have control of circle of influence. So that really very, was very instru um, was, um, instrumental in some of the actions I've taken during the course of this, um, this series. Then, some of us respond to things from the prism of the world. We allow the world to define us. We answer to the name the world calls us. But more importantly for me, the last thing that stood out for me was all things are created twice. All things are created twice. First is in our imagination. Things are created in our imagination. So that means the things you look at in the world, things you look at, um, probably things that comes to your mind, first comes to your imagination. And the fact is that one thing with imagination is that when it comes to you, if you don't take charge of it, it goes to another person. So that has helped me. I've had a lot of things that have come to me. I've not really been able to create it. So within the context of this, um, or within the course of this um, uh, series, I've been able to go back to some of those things, and I've started um, trying to create those things. And God has given me a lot of, um, um, probably, what will I call, um, grace, with regards to people um, talking. One of them is the, 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 the imagination I've had for a while, and then um, nothing happened until I started, during the course of this, I started creating that. And I was going to talk to the governor, and I was able to have access to the governor within the course of this. Probably if I started, if I didn't start it, probably I wouldn't have come. I've been looking for access to the governor, that wouldn't have come. But because of this course, and because of, um, I understood that things come twice, imagination and creativity. So immediately I started putting into practice, that contact came. So those That's are amazing. things that stood out for me in this session. Thank you. So amazing. Thank you so much. So in case you're just joining us, perhaps for the first time, and you're wondering what we are talking about, so some of the seven habits that we, I mean, not some, the seven habits that we've gone through over the past few weeks, the first one was being proactive, right? And we talked about um, focus and act on what you can control and influence instead of what you can't. The second one was to begin with the end in mind. So define clear measures of success and have a plan to achieve them. The third one was to put first things first. So that talked about being able to prioritize your goals instead of just reacting to urgencies. Then the fourth habit was to think win-win, right? So collaborate more effectively with people so that there is nobody on the losing side, right? The, the fifth habit was to seek first to understand then to be understood, right? So how to influence others by developing a deep understanding of their needs and perspective. The sixth habit was to synergize, which is um, how to work with people, even people that are different from us. And then the last one was to sharpen the soul, which is um, intentionally investing in renewing activities, whether it is for our physical or spiritual growth. So I'm going to turn to the panelists, and I'm going to ask them to share their own insights from the series. So I'll start with ladies first. Okay, praise God. <laughs> okay, so for me, I think the one that really stood out is um, seek first to understand and then to be, uh, to be understood, particularly empathic listening. So just like Benita said, I'm not one person, unfortunately, or I'm like the opposite. I'm not one person to um, be quick to speak. You know, when the Bible says be slow to speak I'm, and quick to listen. So when I meet somebody, I may not be quick to speak. But then, when it comes to listening, I realize that I am not quick to list listening. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, so I've had instances where somebody's talking to me. I may not be speaking, but my mind is not even there. And then I realize that I'm not present in the conversation. And then later on, they're like, but I've told you this before. And I totally do not even remember anything they've said. So when Pastor talked about that, it really stood out for me, and I realized that this is something I really need to work on, to be present, because that is one thing about empathic listening, not just showing empathy or putting yourself in the person's shoes, but also to be present, to listen. And I think another thing about empathic listening is also being able to, sometimes somebody comes to speak to you, and the person actually needs um, you to give them something, or like a word of wisdom or something. I think it's very important that we do not just listen, but we are also asking the Holy Spirit, oh, what am I supposed to say to this person? 
because you also want to give them good advice from scriptures and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for that. Um, I must really thank the leadership, church leadership, for the opportunity. Can you hear me very well? So thanks, Pastor, for the opportunity to um, even partake in this um, series and to also um, be able to partake in this um, session. First of all, I must say that the session has been a really um, impactful one for me, and um, it has been amazing. And um, it has really um, helped me to understand um, a lot of things. Um, it's first all began with being proactive um, as, as the first habit. And um, I can really see um, that particular habit as the, the habit that helps you not to be uh, in the mercy of anybody, but being in charge of your situation. And um, um, the fact that the world is not happening to us, the life that we live is not happening to us, but we are the ones happening to the life. And um, the fact that in this world, we have to go offensive rather than defensive because no matter what happens, you already know the devil is going to bring the word to you. So you have to, a better way to even go defensive would be to go offensive. And the whole series, the seven of them, um, the seven habits are kind of, they are all interlinked um, because, um, in fact, they are even summarized into two, the public habit, um, the public uh, victories and the private victories, and the fact that you can't win the public victories without first winning the uh, private victories, and this was very evident in David's life. When um, he or, um, David was already killing bears, um, lions, before he had to yeah. go public, so it's kind of um, a shift for me, a, 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 a shift of perspective for me. And even before we began the series, Pastor began with um, the paradigm. And um, I saw that um, most times what God even wants us to do is to, to shift our perspective. For instance, you are praying for something. Um, possibly you are praying for that thing to be possessive of that thing, but God is actually... Um, what God really wants you to do is to, um, to, to um, be able to kind of be in a position where you won't just be possessive of those things, but you could act as a vessel through which he blesses other people. Like the, the, the song today by Victor says that God help me to be a blessing to, if you want to bless anybody, make me that vessel through which you bless someone. And that's a totally different perspective from the normal kind of prayers that we pray. Because sometimes people, you hear people say, Lord, I want this car, I want this house. To what end? Just to own it, right? But um, if you actually change your perspective from that mindset of, you know, being possessive of that item, just see it as maybe, Lord, if you give me this, you already know that people are going to be blessed with this, Right? God is even, if you are God and you want his kingdom to come on earth, you already know that this person is doing your will. You, you even be in a haste to do that. So I think um, um, the whole um, um, series has really been, they've really been um, an amazing one for me. And um, wrapping it up with that of um, the fact that we are all, um, in a community, and God's intention for us is to be in a community, and that we um, can't do anything on our own. I have a lot of you know scenarios that I would like to say, but because uh, of this, because this is an introduction, I'll just have to go straight. And um, the fact that our interaction with people will totally depend, or is more like a reflection of how much we love God. Thank you very much. So good morning, church. Good morning, sir. I, what stood out for me was the third point, or the, um, which is 
Fujian first thing first. I really didn't have so much issue with that, but I had issues with the quadrant in which I was, <laughs> which was the first quadrant. I think that is wow. urgent and important. I tend to function better when things are urgent and important. But it has you know, a side effect. I'm agitated, I am under pressure. But over the years, I've kind of built myself to work well within that you know, quadrant. But I've learned that that's not too good. You should be in a position whereby things are not urgent, but things are important. And I think that's very important for every one of us to learn from. Thank you. So before I ask the question, um, when I was going through the notes and listening to the sermons again, something that stood out to me is we can, for me, I think I can summarize the seven habits into three points. To love God, to love people, and to love yourself. Because if you love God, you would you will put God first, yeah. right? If you love people, you will seek their good. Yeah. You, would, you would not always seek to be win-win. You would not always seek to be win-lose, where even, even if you're not the one losing, but you've lost the boy, you have resentment in your heart against the person, right? And if you love yourself, have you ever seen somebody do something and you think, ah, you don't, don't you like yourself? What kind of silly decision is this? If you love yourself, you would invest in your own renewal, both to build capacity to work in your destiny. And if you love people, you would, sometimes you want to get a job or you want to build a business to a large extent because you know that this would create employment for others. I'll be able to pay better salaries and all of that. And that is putting people first. And during the week, I was reading through the story of Abraham and I got to the point where Lot's servants were fighting Abraham's servants. And Abraham said, okay, for peace to reign, let us go our separate ways. And he asked Lot to choose where he would go to. And I was just thinking in my head, if God had already told me to leave my father's house, right, to a land that I do not know, if somebody is fighting me, I will further of all think, okay, let me look for the worst part of, because God did not tell Lot to go leave his father's house. God told me, and then Lot followed me. So I should be the one telling Lot where he should go. I'll look for like the least favorite part of town and say, oh yeah, you and your people go there. But Abraham told Lot, where do you want, like you and find a place that you and your people can go. And Lot looked at the land and said, this part that has green that the land is green, the animals are healthy, it's not cold, it's, the weather is nice, it doesn't rain every day, it's not hot like Abuja. That is the part that I want to go to. And Abraham said, okay, go. And it was when Lot left that God came and showed Abraham the portion that he had, right? And told him about the blessings that he was going to give him in Christ himself. And I was just thinking, if Abraham had not put... Lot first, right? Or not such synergy. Sometimes entering into God's will for our lives starts with loving other people and putting other people first and not always seeking for our own good first above others. And that was something that really stood out to me from the session. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to like go around and I will ask Mr. Ife this question. And it is, so we talked about being um, dependent, then independent, and interdependent, right? So you have two amazing young kids. And I wanted to ask about how are you intentionally, I know right now they are dependent on you for everything, or you and your wife for everything. How are you both raising them up to be independent and ultimately in that interdependent adults as they grow up? All right. Um Raising children is difficult. Raising children is very demanding. Um, it's scary too. Sometimes I'm in awe of what I am doing, raising the boys up. Um, so that helps me to you know, be very intentional about certain things that I do. I'm not so present. Um, 
like their mom, their mom is not present. However, um, I try to recognize certain things that um, are becoming traits and character. And um, sometimes I have missed the right response. I was not responsible. Um, but thankfully, I am very introspective. I usually evaluate my actions and my thoughts. So um, I observe my, the outcome of my action. And that informs whether I will continue in that particular action or I will take another ac action. And that is also helping me to understand the individuality of each of them because they are kind of different. Yeah. And what gets to each of them is different. They are also different in their nature and character. So, um, of course, they are, they are still dependent on us um, to a larger extent, but they are becoming independent. Of course, they can have their bath. They can sometimes, their mom had taught them how to cook their food. Um, they do certain things in the house right now. So they are becoming um, independent. But it's important to also lay the foundation for interdependence because um, it's a world where everything is connected. A child or a person by him or herself cannot do everything. So you can use the example of um, a school, for instance. Thankfully, in their school, not like my the school that I, I went to. You know, it's the teacher from primary one to primary five that taught us math, English, social science, all those subjects. <laughs> in their school, the literacy teacher is different from numeracy teacher, different from science teacher, different from, you know, so we talk to them about that, saying that it is better when someone is killed in, in a particular thing and is teaching you. Now, the knowledge that it brings to you is better than someone who is not skilled in that. So I just point the attention to you that. So we have a lesson teacher that helps them. I could be helping them. One, I don't have the time. Then I don't have the skill. So if he's bringing that knowledge to you, it means that there's a level of dependence that you need from him. So the dependence from different parts that the world brings to us, that life brings to us, is what forms the interdependence. So helping them to know that they also need each other. Um, you can't do your coughing. Can, you, can your brother help you? Or can somebody help you? So it's important that we, we oh, you're asking me what I do. So what I do is I try to point their attention to them not being on their own or, or seeing life just from a personal perspective, broadening their, their mind about you know, how life is and how life operates. Life is not just about you. It's about a lot of other things, and those other things will have some contribution to you, and you also have some contribution to them. That's amazing. Thank you so much, sir. All right. So I'm going to ask um, Mr. Chibuza. So you're a young professional, and you're also the leaders of the lead singles, right? So what are some ways that you have or what are some ways you so perhaps, I want to say you have developed the ability to empathize and communicate, but you may feel like, oh, it's something you're still learning. So perhaps you can share with us how you're still learning, and if it's something that you're really good at, how did you get to that place where you're able to communicate effectively at the workplace with the people that you lead in church, and also be empathetic, right? And what are some of the results that you've gotten from doing this? Okay, um, I must say that I'm not there yet, and um, although I'm making efforts, so there are actually ways that I've, practical ways that I've um, implemented to be able to, um, um, you know, have a better relationship with people, both in my family, at work, and even in church. So, um, and um, I would say that the first would, I would like to draw from what Pastor um, taught on about um, the emotional bank account and um, the fact that deposits can be made and withdrawals can be made. And um, because of that, you would, I would be very intentional in um, making deposits rather than making withdrawals. I know there are times that you can't help it but to make withdrawals, but um, there, there should be this intentionality in making deposits because at some time when your cup has full, someone can still ha have your back, kind of. So um, um, those deposits are actually 
for me are practical ways that I can ensure that um, um, I have effective communication, empathetic um, listening as well, right? And, um, and the result now would be that those people that you have made these deposits to, will, they will already know that you have their back and um, that you can go extra miles for them. Um, and in terms of relationships, it becomes better because um, they tend to even listen to you. They tend to, um, you listen to them as well, right? So um, another practical way is to help put yourself in the position to be an help, a help to them. So for instance, you know that um, this person likes a certain thing, maybe he likes mango very well. You can always go to the market and get mango, right? And give to the person. So those are deposits. And um, just try as much as possible not to make withdrawals. But if it warrants, you can't help it, but make deposits. Thank you. That's so good. So I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to share a little confession. Um, one time, I think Mr. Nelson invited me to his office. And he's someone that I truly admire and I really I see him as a mentor. So I texted a few people that he works with. I was like, oh, what does he like? So they sent me like a list of his favorite biscuits, everything. So I made sure that I got it. And I, when I went to his office, like, and he, he looked so happy. And he made me so happy. I was like, yes. <laughs> so that when I need career and business advice, <laughs> I've made the deposit. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's very good. And it also reminds me of something that I learned from my husband. So when he would talk about how when he used to work in a physical office, when he got into work every morning, he would go to his um, CEO's office and he would ask, oh, is there anything that I can help it? It's not as if he doesn't have work, right? Yeah. Obviously, he has his own long to-do list, but he would still go and ask, oh, what do you need help with? Is there anything that I can help with? And sometimes, some of them to say no. They will give him like work that is not in his job description. But he would still do it, and he would do it well. And I feel like that, that um, I started to try it. So if there's anything that anybody that has worked with me will say, it's that I always go over and beyond what is required. And they may think, oh, she's so nice, she's so hardworking. It is the pussies that I'm making. Yeah. So that when I come for increase in pay or for you to extend my contract, you will know that I've proven that I'm valuable and I've gone to gone over and beyond. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so Bamba, I wanted to ask about self-renewal, which was the, what we learned last week. Um, so sharpening your sword. And I think that self-renewal in a way is connected to the first habit, which is being proactive, right? So you don't wait till there is war to prepare your weapons, right? I mean, we don't have war now, but um, let me think of a good example. You don't wait till there is scarcity of food before you start, you know, storing food properly or money. Don't wait till you, you, you are in lack or you are broke before you start creating budget, learning about personal finance and all of that. It is good to prepare ahead of time. So what are some ways that you invest in your own self-renewal? Okay, thank you. Um, I think last week, Pastor talked about three aspects, three or four, um, three physical, spiritual, and mental. And I think these days, the world is even moving so fast. Like, before you even know it, you're in the war already. So I think that this is a consistent thing that we should always do. Spiritually, for instance, I make sure that every day I pray. And, you know, we have voice of victory in the mornings. Um, but beyond that, I think it's very important that we ourselves also take our time to pray, to seek the face of the Lord, praying in the Spirit. I think that is one thing that has helped me. It really helps you to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit when you speak in tongues a lot. Um, uh, another thing is studying the Word. So basically what I do is I just read and read and read. Like I just keep on reading because sometimes you are in a situation and that is when it's the Holy Spirit that brings to your remembrance. That's scripture. But if there's no scripture stored up in your heart, what will it bring? So I think that is very important that you just, even if you're not doing a deep study, just keep on reading. I mean, just start with the Gospels, a story. Just keep on reading and reading. 
Um, physically, I think one thing I'm doing more now is um, choosing what I eat, <laughs> being more careful about what I eat, um, trying to eat, eat maybe less carbs and eat more protein. Um, I think that it also helps you to just make sure that you are fit. Yes, and well, last year I started going to the gym, but <laughs> I wasn't consistent, but I think that maybe I'll start going. I actually lost weight after I went. Um, <laughs> some people are laughing. Yes, I did, I did, because, I mean, but I think that beyond, beyond going to lose weight, my aim was not even going to lose weight, actually. It was just to keep fit. And then I realized that it also helps your brain. Because before you know it, you can see that you can push through it. But when I first went there, I didn't know I could lift a weight. And the first, the, the gym instructor told me, say, you're allowing your fear to lead you. Because I was really scared of lifting a weight. And so after I did it for like two, three times, I realized that, oh, I could lift this um, kg. I could lift that. So I think that is How many kg? <laughs> Well, maybe like 10. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, but it's, it's been a year already, so I think I need to go back by now. Yes. So, um, lastly, mentally, um, I think it's very, one thing that's helped me mentally is I started reading books back when I was in university, like different um, books. Mostly I was reading Christian books, but I think these days I'm trying to read other aspects, things like history. I didn't study history in school, yeah. so I realized that I, when people are talking about history, I barely know anything. And so I'm trying to catch up, I'm trying to read, but really reading is very important. A lot of times we're on our phones, and if you actually look at how many hours you're on the phone, you realize that you could have re read a chapter of a book or listened to an audio book. So I'm really trying to read more now. That's so good. Thank you. So does, do we have any question? Okay, so if we have questions, let's just go to the, our question corner very quickly so we can see how many people. Okay, just one person. I don't want to start now, and then when we have 25 seconds more, you start standing up, oh. please. All right, great. So I have a question for um, Pastor Ife, then we'll take on the questions from those standing behind. And it was um, regarding something that PG had mentioned. So the question goes, um, PG, mentioned, PG, PG had mentioned that the way our lives eventually turn out is a cumulative result of the decisions we make on a daily basis. Pastor Tukbe had also expanded on this sequentially during the series. However, I want to juxtapose it with Romans 9, 16 to 21. Since the wheeling and running could be attributed to the resultant decisions we make. So my question is, is there a balance between our intents and the interference of God in our decision making to bring about what would eventually turn out to become? Our uh, intent and interference between God. I will first of all interrogate interference. That is the assumption that we have, um, our life is ours. That is the assumption that you have a life to yourself. Um, Pastor Kwe used an analogy that, you know, some people might go high climbing a ladder, then they get to the top and realize that they were leaning against the wrong wall. Yeah. I think the most important thing is to firstly identify that, see, your life is God's, so God is not interfering in your life. Amen. So the intent that you have it is better that it is aligned with God from the onset. You better know that you are leaning against the right wall from the beginning so that you don't get to the top and realize that, oh boy, it's, I was just making decisions on myself. So to say that um, we make decisions, we have to make decisions. We have to take certain steps. It's not every time and in every situation that we are led of God audibly. But it's important that we know that if our minds are renewed and aligned with God, then the decisions, ordinary decisions that we make can be the same which is the intent and the purpose of God. Amen. Such that when God now says something, it is not so different or it's not different from what is already in your mind. And the only way you can get there is by being renewed in your mind, feeding your mind with the word of God. And, you know, keep growing in the things of God. Then you can now say that my thoughts are aligned with the thoughts of God. Like um, Elijah, 
Elijah will pray that there will not be rain. And he will say that it will not rain only by my word. I question that. How can Elijah say that? Elijah cannot make rain to fall or rain not to fall. It was at the instance of God. But he got to a situation whereby God's word had so much entered him that he could say that God's word is what I'm saying. It's my word. Now, at my word, there won't be rain. So it's just to encourage and every one of us to align ourselves with God. And the only way you can do that is through the reading. Bambo mentioned that. Reading, meditation, study of God's word to the extent that you are formed by the word of yeah. God. And when you are formed by the word of God, it means that you have the purposes and the intent of God inside you. Wow. Such that your decisions, your life is based on that. And anything you do is just aligned with the purposes of God. So when God speaks, he's already aligned. But if you are on that other side, you see as if I was living with my, I was living my life. Oh, God just came and said that I should go to Kaduna. What's my own in Kaduna? But the truth is from the beginning. Because we need to understand that God does not just come and say that, do something. It has always been there. God doesn't just change his mind over time. He doesn't. What happens is that perhaps we just came into the light of the revelation of his truth, of his knowledge. So why, why don't you try and reveal yourself, or rather expose yourself to that truth from the beginning? It will save you a lot of time. It will save you a lot of stress. It will save you a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm just trying to emphasize that God does not just come into your life. God owns your life to start with. Um, so it's important that you align yourself with God so that when God speaks, whatever he says is already aligned with what is inside you because what is inside you is his word. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay, so we have two questions. Let's go. Um, good morning, church. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I really enjoyed um, the series. It was very timely for me. Um, and I think I could relate with it mostly in terms of my career. Um, by my own estimates, by my own plan, I've been in my job way, way longer than I planned to. And I struggled um, a lot with it. Um, I think one of the things that stood out for me was when Pastor talked about ensuring how you win your personal victories. He said you have to identify your roles. And when you know what is expected of you, then you can meet your obligations. So that's one part. Then here today, we've had a lot of discussions around um, how you make um, emotional deposits. So for me, in the career place, like the example YMC gave of her um, husband doing things that are outside um, his maybe responsibilities or what is expected of him. So I struggle with that a bit because um, some people might say, I was having a conversation with my sister. And I said, oh, they said I'm difficult. And then it's something that I've struggled with. And she said, no, you're not difficult. You're principled. And people don't, um, people might struggle with that. So I think for me, if I know like one, two, three, four, and my responsibilities in the office, I do one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four has to go to somebody else to do five, six, seven, eight. So I think what happens a lot of the time is that you find that people have to do one, two, three, four, and then do five, six, seven, eight, because the person is not picking up. And then those people are seen as maybe making emotional deposits, whereas I'm like, everybody needs to do what they are supposed to do. That's how an organization should work. So I, I struggle with that, and I don't know if anybody can help. How do we balance that out? How do I know when it's okay to step out to do the extra just so that things go well, or when should I stand and stick to it and say, no, let everybody do what they're supposed to do? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. 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 You can ask your question, and then maybe okay. we'll just answer it. Um, sorry to take our times again. Um, it's in line with what she asked, you know, and that's um, why the win-win stood personally for me. Because, <laughs> to be honest, I'm starting to think the win-win is um, almost impossible. I stand to be corrected because, um, you know, I talked about um, being the person that, okay, you bring your nonsense to me, I change it for you, you know, <laughs> and um, I'm this person that my loved ones, I want the peace to reign, you understand? So I'm moving that, I'm extending that grace to um, external people to, you know, stay calm and somehow it occurs to me that it's starting to look like a lose-win. 
and also has me reflecting on, you know, Jesus said, when they slap you on the right cheek, you turn the left. So that's not a win-win. Maybe your win is in heaven. So <laughs> I'm starting to think about it. That is the win-win actually, um, you know, a reality. Thank you. So, so you, have, you started that earlier, and I wanted to speak to it. Um, these, these principles are not isolated. They, are, they work together. Yeah. So this one cannot, you can't work it out by itself. So it progresses to the next level of, what's the fourth one, which is, um, or the fifth one? Seek first to understand. Then after that, synergy. By understanding people, at least you know their position. You know their differences. Now, synergy comes in. The place of synergy is to identify the differences and see how you can make it work for the collective good. At that instance, it becomes a win-win. So the, the trying to arrive at a win-win, haven't understood what win-win is, is already a failure. You, will, you, will, you can never achieve it if you don't step up to the next level and step up to the next level. And that is when you can actually um, um, make it work. However, win-win requires, still requires a level of sacrifice. It requires time as well. The time it takes is to understand empathetic listening and also to be able to merge or connect the differences or the different skills together so that it can work together so that you can win and the person can win. Now, linking this to, um, I can't remember her name, Nengi's, Nengi's question. Um, Nigeria, or not just Nigeria, because I have some people that have spoken to me about work ethics in some other places. Some people are, but Nigeria generally, we have very poor work ethics, very poor work ethics. So someone who is principled will be said to be difficult. But the truth is, I've understood that a lot of people that appear to be difficult, they just work by certain rules. And particularly if they are bosses, they work by, they want things to be done in a particular way because they've understood um, their work process to follow a particular line. And if they can do that, they're going to achieve the desired outcome. Now, our General work ethics makes it difficult for people who are termed difficult because they become more difficult. Because you came in with a very nonchalant attitude to work. Now, this person had planned his or her time, his or her resources to ensuring that work is done at a particular time and then move on to the next. But you, rather than do your part, you... Um, expect that another should do it. So I want to create the difference between what um, Charles does and what Nengi um, narrated. Um, what Nengi narrated is someone who will naturally be unwilling to do work. I don't expect any of us to be in that position. And if you are in that position, please change because you are frustrating another person. However, um, because we are Christians and you know the word of God is is double-edged sword. Yeah. In as much as you are looking for that person to be disciplined enough or to grow and mature quickly to do and take up his own responsibility or to be responsible, um, we also have to look at the collective goal. So this is an organization that certain objectives or goals must be met at a particular time. Mm. So if this person is not meeting up with that and I have the time or I have the capacity to handle it, I think it's in the best interest of the organization to do it while you develop something that can help the organization address um, the excesses or the, yeah. of some other people. Sorry? In the incompetence of some other people. So it's important that if you find yourself in Nengi's situation, don't just go ahead and do it. Also make arrangements or report to the necessary. Sometimes you can't report to your boss. So how do you undo such a thing? Uh, you call the person to order. Your boss to order. Okay, so, 
So, so what, what, what um, faith is talking about is communication. So you have to be able to communicate with that person, letting the person see how important it is for him or her to handle his or her duty or responsibility in order for the organization to meet the goal. I don't know if I... Yeah. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be... Yeah. So I'm going to... So we have a few more questions, but before they ask, I want... I think this win-win conversation is a big deal, right? Because yeah. I, I still have some questions, but I would want... I want to call some people in the audience. Sorry, you. But I want to call some people in the audience to ask um, them this question. And I want to hear Pastor Gwenro's perspective, especially because I know he manages teams and his head of admin and operations and all of that. And I also want to ask Mrs. Debbie. Um, so a question that we have here regarding the win-win. And I'm asking her because she's in a family unit, right? So I think she's very competent to answer this question. So it's about how... Um, so the person was trying to say, okay, women especially, you know, you just do, like, let everybody be happy except me, right? And then putting themselves last. Um, and the, mind, the win-win mindset is about going from competition to collaboration. So how do you think, especially as women, that we can put others first? Because I think when it comes to putting others first, a woman knows how to do that very well. But how can you do that without consistently putting ourselves yeah. in a lose position? Yeah. So that's one, right? In addition to like general workplace situation. Then thirdly is the question that um, Mr. Coyote asked earlier, because I was going to ask that question as well. I'm the kind of person that if I have corrected you a number of times about something or expressed my displeasure, I mean, the fact that I'm even correcting you means I care about you and the relationship, because if I don't care, I'll most likely just move on, right? But there are situations where maybe with a sibling, the person keeps doing that same thing, and you cannot disown your sibling. And, it's, and the only person who is getting, I mean, some people can, but I mean, um, I, and the only person who is getting upset by the situation is you, that is angry at what the person is doing. So how can you move on so that there is peace without it looking like a win-lose situation? So I will ask Mr. Agbenru and then Mrs. Debbie. Praise God. Can we all hear me? Yes. Okay, so please permit me to sit. Um, one of the interesting things that I do is that whenever I'm doing something interesting at work, I tend to share with the men of influence group. So some time ago, I shared one of the principles I live by, but I found like, let's call it textual backing for it. So there's a principle called extreme ownership. It's something from the Navy SEALs and the Marines where you take ownership of any job that is allocated to you. So if they tell you, okay, you are in charge of streaming today's service until service is streamed, right? Irrespective of I'm the pastor, there's, an, there's a minister, there's an HOD, there's somebody in charge of streaming, there's somebody supposed to put on the internet, until the entire thing is done, I am responsible. So, in terms of leading people, and that is kind of what um, Sister Nengi also, you know, spoke about. You want the entire job to be done. But I, I used the phrase some weeks, um, about a week ago when we were talking about um, sovereignty of God and how far um, with man's will and so on. There's always a tension. And the big part of the Christian walk is managing that tension. The tendency for someone to now take extreme ownership means that very likely you will not delegate well. It means very likely you are not able to train. It means very likely people will see you as proud. Very likely people will also take advantage. That, uh -uh, PG will be there. Let's, let's relax. Do you understand? Now, being able to manage that tension is the Christian work, Gongo. You see, extreme ownership is a human life principle. You have decided that, me, I will always be excellent. 
But you also now have to take on the spiritual gifts of humility, of servant leadership, of being able to speak to someone to help them understand how this whole picture, their failure impacts on the whole. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, the message I'm saying, or the point I'm making is that there would always be that tension. The Christian does not have break of saying, I have done my own. I'm stopping my Christian name for one hour. <laughs> you are going to have to continue. Hopefully, and this is where we pray, that everybody also becomes Christian. So the person that you are working with is able to take the good lessons you are showing and is able to then respond, reciprocate, and do their part. A lot of the times, we also forget that there is a skill gap. Nigeria, for what it is, and even the way churches are run, the way things are taught, creates that intentional skill gap. So some people don't see wrong, anything wrong in they didn't tell me to do it, so I, I, I don't need to do it. Do you understand what I'm saying? We also have to now take on the responsibility of training people so that they learn that your life is not your own. You are part of God's body. And because of that, everything you do is about God. Praise God. That's very good. Thank you so much. Nice. He needs a mic. Praise God. So, um, if I got your question right, how do we, as women, put others first yeah. and at the same time not neglect ourselves? Yeah. Okay. Uh, coincidentally, I was um, chatting with purity and I was saying from the, the scripture that Jesus responded to the Pharisees where... He said, they were asking about um, the greatest commandment. And he said, love God with all your heart and all of that. And the next is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That we have, for me, the priority has been wrongly placed. You love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't understand how to love yourself, then you will not know how to effectively love your neighbor. Now, um, in my own life, I had seen that I was doing, being a preacher's kid, I had learned from childhood, oh, put everybody first, put everybody first. And at the end of the day, I neglected myself and realized when God brought it to my attention that I was wounded and trying to help others. So I needed to be whole and okay to help others. When we say love yourself, it's not what I see where you just make yourself feel good or act in a selfish way. It's actually really taking good care of you in a way that you are effective in taking care of others. Take, for instance, as a, a wife, um, practical issues like um, you have energy. Energy is non-renewable. Now, you have energy levels, and you have yourself. These are things you have to do in the house. That day, things are set out. You have to do this, do this, do that. And you run yourself out in a way that you tire out. Take, take for instance, chores. You, you tire out while doing chores. And you still have to spend that energy on children, that same energy on your husband. And you have already depleted everything on chores. Because you want to make sure um, this one is settled. I hope I'm communicating this right. Now, this is settled. And um, uh, okay, maybe this, this wouldn't have been the perfect example for what I, I, I should have explained. Um, <laughs> okay. But if I, if, I, if I consider that I need to be okay for others yeah. to be okay. So I would manage my energy level in such a way that I would do my chores. And while doing my chores, remember that I have to take care of children. I have to be there for my husband. And 
if I need to rest, I will now take a break and rest because I need to be there for the others. I don't know if, the, if that made sense. Yeah. I am taking care of myself because I, I will be most effective in doing so for others. Mm -hmm. Another example I gave to Stapirity, I said, um, I realized that when I started, when the Holy Spirit started bringing to my attention some things that I needed to um, work on, on myself. Now, when I say love yourself, my interpretation of love yourself is pay attention to yourself. Be good to yourself. Good in the sense that you train yourself. Mm -hmm. You um, develop yourself in a way that you are effective in loving others. So if I am skilled at being proactive, not just for myself, I'm going to be very effective while relating with other people yeah. because what they would not see, I would likely see it. Another aspect is um, in terms of hurts, trauma, and all those things. When I am broken and I, have, I pay attention to my own brokenness, like, look, you're hurt here, you're, you're hurting here, you need healing here, you need healing there, and I pay attention to it, I address it. When I see it in other people, I will recognize it because I have dealt with it in my own life. Now, that makes me love others better because when I see this person in the state I have been in and I've dealt with it, I can recognize, it. oh, this is trauma. This is this. It's better you treat it like this. It's better you treat it like that because I have addressed it with myself. So that way, as a woman, I am able to love myself and I will love others better. I hope I answered That's your question. So good. I, I think okay. I want to speak to what she said. Okay. I liked the way she handled it because it kind of balanced it for me. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people abuse certain things. People call loving yourself self-love. It's not the same thing. People use, don't manage their finances to the extent that their children, their family suffer in the name of, I'm taking care of myself. Um, people do different things. Now, from what she said, Loving yourself is winning private victories. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the public victory is at the instance of the private victory, right? So, in many instances, a person who is loving another person might appear not to be doing him or herself good. But because he or she has already won a private victory, she's emotionally, emotionally mentally, physically, spiritually balanced then she can do things that on the outward is as if she's losing herself. But the truth is, she has already gained herself in order for her to be able to do what she just did. Yeah. So you can't look at someone who is giving so much or who is doing so much and feel that this person is wasting away. You can't look at someone and say that, ah, you can be better if you were, you know, managing or if you were working of a woman who decided to, you know, take out time to take care of the children. You know, some people can look at her and say that she's wasting time, she's losing time. But the thing is, she has taken a lot of thoughts into the value she's creating by doing the things she's doing, personally, pers personal victory, to the extent that the public victory is for that child, in quote. But the truth is, by the time she's going to win, those who are saying it might not be there because the child will come out well and she's also fine with it. But from what she said, it's important that anyone should firstly have the private victory. Be convinced within you about the things you are going to do for other people. Otherwise, it's going to be what First Corinthians 13 talks about. That you can say that you, you burn yourself. You give all you have. You, you do all those things, and yet it's without love. Yeah. For it to be with love, it must be rooted in the private victory that she described. So, so did we all learn something today? Yeah. Was this useful? Okay. So I know there are a couple of people with questions, but we've run out of time. So perhaps you can ask your question on the group. And please, next time we put out forms, kindly use it. It would make it easier for us to manage our time. But thank you so very much. And to my panelists, thank you so much as well. So I'll call up Pastor Tokwe to give us the final words and conclusion on the matter. Thank you.